Hi, hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, here with a very special plague episode. Yeah, you heard me. You read the title. I mean, what else am I supposed to do with all these feelings and fears about COVID-19? Anyway, I'm here with another mini myth today because I have only one day off in 10 and as a retail manager during a pandemic, I still have to go to work and plan for what could happen and it's good times, guys. Thankfully, here in Canada, we're in really good shape so far, so I'm sending all the good thoughts imaginable to my listeners in countries having a tougher go during this time. But I'm not here to scare you either because who wants that? Definitely not me. The anxiety is real enough. No, instead, I was simply inspired to throw together an episode about plague in ancient Athens and Greek mythology because of a very funny tweet by the author and classicist Natalie Haynes. And stay tuned after the story, too, because I'll be sharing a few clips from an upcoming episode of Ancient History Fangirl that I guested on. We drank lots of beer and talked about Dionysus. I can't tell you how much fun we had. We'll be doing it again, too, to talk our girl Dido from the Aeneid for my show. But for now, make sure you listen to that clip. It's wildly entertaining. I mean, it certainly was to record. And with that, here we go. Mini-Myth, a prayer to Apollo, the god of music, prophecy, and plague. Like everything else in the natural scientific world, the ancient Greeks had a means of understanding when their cities and people experienced unexpected and contagious illnesses. It was something to be understood alongside all the things the gods did, for good or bad. They were a curious people, the ancient Greeks, even if they did usually just attribute these things to the random whims and angers of the gods. When it comes to illnesses and sicknesses in this ancient world, they all generally fall under the terminology of plague, though I'm not necessarily talking the Black Death here. Simply, well, what we're experiencing now. A very dangerous illness that the Greeks couldn't figure out and which they desperately wanted to end. Hesiod, one of the earliest writers of ancient Greece, at least in terms of what survived, explains to us how sickness was set upon the earth in his work, The Works and Days. And can you guess? If you've taken in anything I've said about Hesiod in the past, you'll know exactly what's coming. Yes, according to Hesiod, the reason the world has any kind of plague or illness or any bad thing at all, really, is because of a woman. Pandora, oh, the famous Pandora, For Hesiod, she is the one who gave us all the sicknesses and all the bad things of the world. You can listen to more about Pandora and the origin of humans in the episode I did so long ago now. Her name's in the title, so it should be easy to find. But for today, I'm simply going to tell you that in that source, all of it is her fault. She opened a jar, that damn jar, and in doing so exposed the world to the nosoi, the personifications of sickness and plague. In Greek mythology, these personifications of plague and disease are called the nosoi, but in Latin, Roman, they're called the morbi, which one might imagine the word morbid comes from. This is how Hesiod describes plague and general sicknesses as obviously the fault of women. Ugh, women, am I right? Anyway, Hesiod hated women before any other angry old white man hated women. A true pioneer. But our man Homer, meanwhile, believed in the title of this episode, that it's Apollo who controls plague as the god of exactly that. And so it's Apollo we all need to dedicate ourselves to over the next while. Apollo brings plague upon people and he can take it away. To be clear, please believe in science and not Apollo. I love the Greeks, but they thought the god of music brought them illnesses, so do not take this seriously. Please trust science and doctors and also wash your hands. For the Greeks, during the Trojan War, you'll remember, Apollo sent them a horrible plague for what they did in their raids against Troy. They'd kidnapped Chryseis, a daughter of a Trojan priest of Apollo who prayed to the god to punish the Greeks and force them to return his daughter. Apollo sends a plague, probably one of the first literary references to something like that. And boy, does it ruin the Greeks. And so we have an example of what the ancient Greeks might have believed could cause an outbreak of a disease in the camp set up during the war. 
definitely wasn't just lack of basic hygiene and death and decay everywhere. It's because Apollo was pissed. But probably the most famous incident of plague in Greek mythology, and certainly the one that has actual historical significance, is the plague in Sophocles' telling of the story of Oedipus. In Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannos, or the more popular Latin title Oedipus Rex, the story opens with a plague in Thebes. Like Pandora, you can listen to a full retelling of this play in earlier episodes. I think it's a two-parter from early days of the podcast. It's a horrific plague in Thebes, killing so many of the Thebans that their king, Oedipus, is hell-bent on finding out the cause. The plague is revealed by the oracle to be caused by a pollution in the city of Thebes. The killer of their previous king resides in the city, thus causing a horrible plague. This is the one oracle in the play that doesn't royally fuck shit up. Of course, what the audience of the play knows, and what we know is that the killer of their previous king is Oedipus himself. Oedipus, meanwhile, refuses to even consider the fact that the man he killed on the crossroads between Thebes and Corinth could be the king, even though all the evidence points to it being likely that, and that's not even taking into consideration that the king was actually his father. Oh, Oedipus, what a dramatic play with a wildly insane storyline that I love so desperately. But what makes this play extra interesting is the possibility that it was written during an actual plague in the city of Athens. Athenian tragedy, which is most, if not all, the tragedy we have, often placed its plays in other cities, in this case Thebes. This was a means of controlling the narrative, making it a tale to learn from, but not something directly affecting the Athenians. In the case of Oedipus, the story is primarily about tyranny, and just how horrible it is to live in a world without the democracy that they had at the time in Athens. But it's the inclusion of the plague that I find interesting. It's only speculation, though speculation made by scholars and not just me, that suggests it could have been written during the actual plague of Athens, because we don't actually know the dates of the play, but close. But during the Peloponnesian War, Athens experienced an absolutely devastating plague. It's debated, but it was likely typhoid or typhus, both scary shit, and it killed approximately 75,000 to 100,000 people in just Athens. That's such an enormous section of the population that the toll on the city and the culture was unimaginable. So why would Sophocles set his play in a time of plague when a plague was actually going on? To provide the city with hope, maybe, or to place judgment on the actions of Athenians, just as the actions of Thebans was the cause of a plague in Thebes. Pericles, the leader of Athens, died in the plague. He was democratic, but he was quite the ruler, quite the king-like ruler in a democratic state, so possibly Sophocles was commenting on that. That's all guesswork on my end. I'm not going to lie. All of that was just straight out of my brain, based on some of the information that I have. Every once in a while, I just like to speculate wildly. I just think it's interesting that at the least, at a very similar time period, we have one of the most famous Greek tragedies adding a plague to a much older myth that did not include a plague at all, and possibly during an absolutely unbelievable epidemic. In this story of plague, one must interpret it as being partially caused by Apollo, simply as the god of both plague and prophecy, which is only made clearer by the oracle herself confirming the reason behind the plague. Apollo, were to assume, was working behind the scenes of the whole thing, trying to force out the original king, Laius's murderer, and perhaps holding a grudge against old Oedipus for how poorly his earlier oracular prophecy was handled. But for that, you'll need to listen to the earlier episode, which honestly, one day I'll also redo because, oh man, was I just so surface level back then? There's so much more to all of it. I still get bad reviews because of it. I just scream into my computer. I got so much better and more in depth later. Damn it. Anyway, I'm rambling back to the plagues. Live. Most importantly, we must discuss not only Apollo, the god of plague, but his children and grandchildren and their role in controlling such things. Apollo could bestow plague and take it away, but there was still the matter of health itself. We all remember Apollo's son Asclepius, the god of medicine. He's important in this context, certainly, but it's his daughter I really want to tell you about. 
Asclepius's daughter, the Greek goddess of health, cleanliness, and sanitation, oversaw the health of the Greek people and was so important in their daily lives as the force behind their ability to continue on. She was worshipped alongside her father in temples dedicated to health and wellness, where people would ask to be healed or soothed, and she is named Hyia. That's with a G, even if it doesn't sound like it, making her name just a few letters off from the word hygiene, and so that's where we get it from. So hygiene is basically the goddess of health. Her sister, another daughter of Asclepius, is named Panakeia and is the goddess of cures, the all-healing, a very important family indeed. So much so that the Hippocratic Oath, the one still used today, though I would assume without the line I'm about to quote to you, begins, I swear by Apollo the physician, and Asclepius, and Hyia, and Panakeia, and all the gods and goddesses, that according to my ability and judgment, I will keep this oath and this stipulation. So, in the immortal and definitely not paraphrased words of Hippocrates, the so-called father of medicine, wash your fucking hands. That, my friends, is the Thrown Together episode on Plague because I had to do something short and isn't it what we're all thinking about anyway? But I won't leave you with the story of sickness, not right now. So what you're about to hear is a collection of fun clips from the upcoming episode of Ancient History Fangirl that I've recorded with those two awesome ladies. There's a link to their show in the description, go subscribe, and you'll get the episode as soon as it's out and you can hear more of our beer-filled talk about the one and only Dionysus. And in general, those ladies are a perfect companion to my show, casual and often full of drink, but deeply researched and awesome. They typically cover history, so between us, you'll know all you'll ever need to know about ancient Greece and Rome. He just likes to come in and fuck shit up, but in kind of a fun way, except for, you know, certain issues in the back eye. Unless you get ripped limb from limb, which isn't fun. Well, no, that's what certain issues in the back eye. And one of the things that to me really stuck out was how the Bacchae is kind of what everyone in ancient patriarchal Greece was afraid women were getting up to when they snuck off into the woods. That's the best interpretation, right? It's like, Well, when women aren't here, they're in the woods, getting drunk together, just going insane. There's animals involved and... Having sex with who knows whom. All the orgies. And men aren't invited. That was the part that really (laughs) just got them, right? That the men were not invited to this orgy fest. Yeah, because women get their own shit. It's like you can see Keith Morrison narrating ancient Rome Dateline in his toga. And he's like, and then they decided to change the will. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, it's always the wife or the wife and the son together because they were Bakkins. Everything was oiled back then. It was olive oil on everything. (laughs) Lube up the whole city. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's like, oh, what what luck. Here you are, Medea. I need some help. And she's like, hey, I might uh, at some point need help. I might be exiled. Who knows why? Who's to say why? Don't ask me why. Let me crash on your couch. Exactly. (laughs) Just no questions asked. Will you take me in? Will you purify me of the sins I'm probably not about to do? And they definitely won't be horrible. There is so many scenes of just enormous erections on all the men involved. Like they just walk <laughs> on stage where I think that their whole like cloaks were supposed to be like standing straight up in the air, like two feet off of them as if they're incredibly well endowed. All the men in it are basically just talking to the women, trying to convince them to give in with their enormous erections. And the women are like, absolutely not. Like we can hold back. <laughs> you can dream, fellas. When having sex with you, no matter how horny we are, has a 50-50 chance of winding up in pregnancy. And pregnancy has like a 70% chance of winding up in death. Go find a sheep, babe. (laughs) I did not hold a stick that in. 
listen, if you're cursed by Aphrodite and you have a little bit of a stank, you don't need to have horrible deodorants that have parabens and lead and aluminum and everything else in them. <laughs> Normal deodorants don't have lead. It's aluminum. <laughs> aluminum is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Why is there lead in the deodorant now? This has taken a real dark turn. <laughs> lead. We don't even have lead in our pencils anymore. Arsenic. <laughs> like I knew it was some metal. <laughs> cigarette butts. <laughs> like, oh, we've devolved. Well, thank you all for listening. You're all the best. Stay safe out there. Wash your hands. Stay inside. Even if you don't have symptoms, you could give it to people whose bodies can't handle it. So just stay home and binge my show instead. Deal? I am Liv, and I love this shit.